is, is you find a unique coalition of, uh, are you recording yet? Yeah, I hit record. Okay. Is it in this, in this ballad of the victory bringer, you find a unique, um, it's really a bringing together of the have them all of the Riggs Thula of several different things that show us a real integral part of how all this works together. And when I think about it, when I think about this process of becoming a man and what he really stands up for, when I think about how he, this treasure opener, begins to seek, begins to seek out this woman where he had to prove himself. There's, there's some real, real important things. And one of the things I didn't talk about last week was how she got there. And I may have mentioned it a little bit, but there's another perspective about Brunhild or Sigdrifa that we don't really talk about. And that's this relationship between a father and a daughter. And it was really, and it really is this, this wound that a father gives to a daughter because she chose someone he didn't approve of. And he gives her this wound that literally paralyzes her uh, for, the, for how many years before a true man can come along. She's not going to bend to his decision. And the, the, the wound creates a persona about her that she can't be free of. And it's only a real man that comes in there that sets that free. And when they begin to, when she begins to give him a memory draught, there's a, a rare, a real unique correlation between what the divine feminine offers this warrior hero and the drink of the drink that Odin secures from Mim's well. And we also find this correlation between the runes there. And I went over some of the runes last week, but we, we all too often skip over that. We just see how interesting the runes are, but there's, this is the same kind of thing that Odin goes through when he gets a drink from Mim's well, the well of Mimir. We have the divine feminine that offers to a man who has had the courage to stand up for who he is, not fall prey to the, the, uh, the, the, the egging on of a lesser man to do something for him he couldn't do for himself. And we end up in this real interesting thing where they're sitting next to each other. And the Riggs Thula talks all through it about how the couple, the first son of the grandmother and grandfather and the mother and the father, when, the, when they bring his bride to him, they bring, bring her to him in a carriage. Uh, she is brought in a wagon or something along those lines. But it's very reminiscent of how the goddess is carried through the countryside in Tacitus' book on Germania. So we have the beginnings of a tradition of a heritage and they sit next to each other and discuss many things before they take their bed. And this is the same thing that's happening here with this couple, this man that has made his way through and this woman that is finally free of, of the sour relationship with her father. <coughs> now the, there's a couple of things that I do. There's some notes in this, in this version that I read that offer some real interesting correlation. The, um, in uh, stanza 11, lines 3 through 6, and that is, the speech runes learned that none may seek to answer harm with hate. Well, he winds and weaves them all and sets them side by side. At the judgment place, when justice there, the folk shall fairly win. Now, that's, it sounds kind of cool, but it, what does it really mean? Well, the, the footnote says, and it's a real interesting explanation, they apparently mean that the man who interweaves his speech with speech runes when he pleads his case at the thing or popular tri tribunal will not unduly enrage his adversary in the argument of the case. This falls under the, the, uh, the guidance of Balder and uh, Forsetti, these two gods that offer the best of all judgments to men. It's an interesting thing that those runes are carved on Balder's tongue. So, Stanza 11 speaks of that and how we might use that in today's world. There's a way to say things and there's a way not to say things. When we go for that overly dramatic, over the top, I am a victim uh, kind of mentality that we think might win us the day, might create pride out of victimhood, we lose that aspect of 
of winding and weaving these runes that will allow other people to look at us and, and get a square or a, a, we, we might get a square deal in the world. So when we learn these speech runes, we're not learning some kind of magic, how we might say something better. We're learning a way where we might be able to interact with all those around us and secure a favorable judgment that comes with being right to begin with. Now, <clears throat> thought runes learn, if all shall think thou art keenest minded of men. Obviously, we need to learn how to think. That Those two lines there are far more important than most people think because when you want to become... People show up and also true, there's a glimmer of hope for a lot of them. Now, I have a, I have a Gothi student for the AFA in Sweden, and I'm training the first Gothi for the AFA in Europe, and it's a, quite a high honor that I, that I take very seriously. But the, but the things that he's having to deal with are much different than the things we're having to deal with. Um, drug addiction, now he may have a a larger deal with alcoholism than we will, but most people show up here because they've, they've put themselves through the ringer in some way. The thought runes learn if all shall think they are keenest minded of men. When we begin to change the foundations of our faith, when we change the spiritual foundation of our life. This is a radical change. When you look at the rest of the world, and you look at 95% of the people, you have to ask yourself, did their mother and father teach them how to think in a manner that would help them become a truly outstanding, remarkable individual? Or did they teach them the things where they could be average just like they were? 95% of the world is taught how to be just as average as, the rest as, as everybody else. And yet when we come into Austria, all of a sudden there's a hint. There's this subtle idea that I might be able to become something more than what I am now. I might be able to change the pattern of my life. I might be able to really step above everything. And the, it's fallen to the easiest path, like a crooked river, where people think that if I, if I can quote the proper source material or I can... I can write a sufficient book report on some ancient 19th century text and call it a source material. And then, uh, well, then I might be considered the keenest minded of men, but you have to ask yourself, okay, so you've quoted this old book. How's that affecting change in your life? How has that helped you change the thought processes that you came in here with? So you've changed the foundation of your life spiritually. The rest of it's going to have to change as well. Or it's just going to be the continuation of the same problems you had with a different coat of paint. Those same kinds of pains that we've all had to deal with, those stumbling blocks in life, they're still going to be there. They're going to have a new coat of paint. And our thought process hasn't going to change sufficiently enough to be able to negotiate those obstacles. Much, and even more, how to not put those obstacles in our place to begin with. Stanza 12 in this ballad of the victory bringer gives us one of the clearest things that I think of when we learn these runes, we're learning how to change the very thought process that brought us to these crossroads to begin with. We're not learning how to write a book report or generate the right source material. We're learning how to change a process of thinking, which will enable us to become what we thought, hoped, dreamed we might become when we decided to become also true. See that right there tells me that all these other things that people are talking about that might be important for us to be considered heathen or pagan or also true, well, they might not really be as important as everybody thinks they are because the thought process hasn't changed. You still see woven throughout those ideas. They're not, we're not winding and weaving well the speech rooms. They're interlaced with buzzwords and words for hate or uh, dislike or do you have the source material or you're not heathen enough because you're not doing it the way I do it or you haven't read enough because, because I've read more than you, therefore the quality of my heathenry might be better than yours. And yet when you look at all of their lives, it's still one of being just average. 
Is that what we change the spiritual foundation of our life for? So we could be average? Or do we change the spiritual foundation of our life so we might be more along the lines of y'all rig and code rig? See, y'all rig figures all this out. He goes and builds, he changes his thought patterns. He learns the language of the birds. He understands these tools, these runes and how they're used. He builds a kingdom for himself. And we get a hint of what we see with today's generation doing it with Cone because after his father takes all that stuff and creates his great empire, Cone's running around in the forest, shooting the birds, screw it off. Being, you know, he's just a rich, spoiled kid. And the birds ask him, what are you doing? Why are you still shooting at us? And we have to ask ourselves the same thing. Why are we still shooting at these old things that haven't brought us anywhere, that haven't moved us forward in life? Why are we still arguing about uh, this or that or source material or what group of individuals we should hate more than the next group of individuals? What are we doing when we're wasting all our time instead of trying to figure out these flows of energies? Cone had the presence of mind to figure it out and say, you know what? You're absolutely right. I'm wasting my time sitting here shooting at these birds that don't mean a hill of beans. I'm spinning my wheels, focusing on things that have, are of absolutely no use to me becoming anything resembling some kind of high-performance individual with self-esteem and confidence that I might go forward and accomplish what I need to accomplish. See, we have these tools of the runes. We've, we've just been told we need to figure out how to interlace them and wind them and weave them well so we might talk so that when people look at us, they'll say, hey, that's a good old boy. That's a, that's a good woman. That's a nice man. That's a nice lady. That's a quality individual to have in the ranks of our community because of the way he speaks. It's not interlaced with hate, discontent, malcontent, disillusionment, chaos, arrogance, egotistical. It's full of confidence and self-esteem. And there's a real fine line between the two. And the thought runes show us how we might think to fully capitalize upon our ability to develop the self-esteem and confidence so many people coming in also to lack. And when they lack that, they tend to bluff, build it up with bluff and bravado, and I'm going to be a Viking, and I'm going to reenact, or I'm going to be a scholar, and I'll read this source material and that source material, and I'll know more than everyone, and I can float above the rest on brain power alone. That's not what the Ballad of the Victory Bringer tells us. This is a crucial moment between two individuals who've already come through a lot to get together. Stanza 13, then throat to ranged and them he wrote and them in thought he made. That's a, that's a passage of Odin getting the runes from the Havamal, similar to the Havamal. Uh, the reference is to the head of men from which Odin derived his wisdom and magic. Christ dropped near, light dropper, and Hrodrofnir, a treasure opener, these are names for Mim. Out of the draught that down had dropped from the head of Hythdropnir and the horn of Hrodrofnir, the light dropper and the treasure opener. On the mountain he stood with Grimir's sword, on his head the helm he bore. Then first the head of Mim spoke forth, and words of truth it told. This is, he sought the treasure, the dropping, the light dropper, the shining, the star that guides us, the Tiwaz, Tear, the North Star, the guiding light, and the opener of treasure. And all of this has to do with the changing of a thought process. Out of the draught that down had dropped. So he took his first drink out of the horn. Same thing with, with uh, Sigurd. Brunhild gives him that first drink of the horn, and a new world opens up in front of him. And on the mountain he stood with his sword. On his head, the helm he wore. He is standing there as a fully confident individual with his full face showing who he is. A helm of war or victory or whatever you want to call it. The, then the first head of Mim spoke forth and the words of truth it told. When the fully confident man, the fully realized man, begins to speak with wisdom, there's going to be words of truth in it. And I assure you, that he didn't stand up there and say, oh, well, I'm going to source this from some 19th century individual, so I might seem smarter than you. This is a confident, intelligent, a man that knows how to speak, a being that knows how to stand up in front of everyone. And when he stands there, there's no question that this is a fully confident individual with self-esteem, 
not someone who lacks self-esteem to the point that he's got to find a reference somewhere else. He can stand up there on his own two feet. This is a terrifying image for most individuals in heathenry. Why, how dare someone stand up and demonstrate the kind of self-esteem that I can't seem to figure out how to generate. It will be vilified. It will be ignored. It will be, it will be lampooned. Any number of things people will do to someone that might stand up after they've had a drink of the well or understand these runes, they will do just about anything to deny the fact that someone has achieved something that they cannot because they didn't have the courage to examine themselves to the point where they might be able to say, yeah, I need to get rid of that. That's really not doing me any good. This kind of anger, righteous indignation, it's not moving me forward anywhere. <coughs> Excuse me. He bade right on the shield before the shining goddess, on Arvark's ear and on Aldabith's hoof, on the wheel of the car of Hrungnir's killer, on Sleipnir's teeth and the straps of the sledge on the paws of the bear and on Braggy's tongue, on the wolf's claw of bear and the eagle's beak, on bloody wings and bridges end, on freeing hands and helping footprints, on glass and gold and on goodly charms, in wine and in beer and on well-loved seats, on Gungnir's point and on Granny's breast, on the nails of the Norns and the night owl's beak. That's one of the few references to owls I see anywhere in the lore. Um, but these, these uh, shield, the shield is Valen, the cooling that stands in the front of the sun and protects us from the heat. Grimna Small Arbok, the early waker, and all Smith, the, early, the all swift. Up and at him, people got to get. The lazy wolf gets no sheep. He must get out of bed early if another man's treasure he would seek. And these are also the horses that draw the sun's cart. So now we're back into kind of a solstitial alignment idea with regards to the runes, how they might line us up with the flows of energy across the surface of the world. There are a few more powerful, visible references to the flows of energy across the world than being in the light of the sun. Hrungnir is the slayer. The slayer of the giant Hrungnir was Thor, but the uh, that line's kind of in bad shape. Uh, but it um, it's talking about Thor. Uh, the name may not be Hrungnir, and Killer is uh, its conjectural addition. Sleipnir is Odin's horse. That's also the thing that carries him between the worlds of the living and the worlds of the dead. You know, we all might get a ride on that horse someday. I don't know. But I do know that an eight-legged horse is also represented in Korean mythology as a horse that can travel between the worlds. Um, Bragi is the god of poetry. Obviously, he needs to have these. Shaved off were the runes that of old were written and mixed with holy mead and sent on ways so wide. So the gods had them, so the elves got them, and some for the way and so wise and some for mortal men. So we're back to a drink. We're back to the kind of drink that changes the... I mean, let's face it. When someone starts drinking, their, their, their inhibitions are loosened. There is a mind-altering state that occurs when we drink. Now, the meat of those days wasn't just alcohol. Those, they had other substances in them, and many of them were psycho, psychoactive substances that allowed a person who was the king of his own home to experience an interaction with the divine that has been... It really has been vilified. That's one of the first things they did when the church came through was to vilify our ability to connect with the, with the, with the divine on our own. So they substituted our ability to do it with the idea that Jesus Christ did it for us, so we really don't need to do it. Uh, you can go on about your way. These people are going to work on your behalf with regards to God and so on and so forth. In those days, when these runes were shaved off and spread, they were shared with men so that we might interact with all of these realms. <laughs> Beach runes there are, birth runes there are, and all the runes of ale. See, the, the charm part of it, when they carve them on a charm, um, yeah, I don't want to get into that. So the runes to get them in that mead, the runes were shaved off by Othan from the wood on which they were carved, 
and the shavings bearing them were put into the magic mead. And that footnote there, that clarification is just what I said. Our ability to connect with the divine at that time relied heavily upon um, men using these kind of psychoactive substances. So when you would drink, there might be some kind of clarification as to what these runes mean. There might be some kind of mystical element to it. There might be a greater understanding of the flows of energy across the world. And that's, that's key to so much of what we do is our ability to understand all of this. So when they take the runes, these very keys to the universe, put them into a substance that men can drink, it is akin to Odin once again drinking from the well. It opens up that third eye that we might see and have greater understanding of what's going on around us. It frees us of the limitations and conditioning that society has put upon us to begin with. And that's one of the most important aspects of it is that we, we shed some of that conditioning that we've been raised up to be just average. Now all of a sudden we've got a real key, a real avenue, a real pathway to go beyond just being that average individual to being something much more, to being a fully confident, individual full of his own self-esteem and confidence that he might make a, a strong, powerful partner with someone of the opposite sex who's also gone through it and become something better, stood her ground, so, so to speak. The magic runes of might who knows them rightly and reads them true has them himself to help ever they aid till the gods are gone. That is... I mean, if you know anything about Christianity, you understand that the Holy Ghost was left behind after Jesus Christ was sacrificed to be the great comforter. People that are building a spiritual foundation for their life are always, there's a certain type of individual that is developing a spiritual foundation for their life that lives in a state of expectant phenomena. They expect to see something magical happen to validate their belief in the divine and what they're doing. You see him talk about, I saw two crows in the backyard. I found this feather. I was walking along and I saw this rune. Um, uh, you see it quite a bit in, in your Wiccan kind of ideas. They have a life of expectant phenomena. They are always looking for something out there to justify what they're feeling in here. This is, this is one of those leftover remnants when they took from us the ability to drink that ale imbued with runes or psychoactive substances and experience it for ourselves. A fully confident individual, and we see a further uh, continuation of that in more of a, in your right and left hand path, you see, instead of looking for the sign of expected phenomenon, the flip side of that coin is people who believe that I'll find a source material and then I'll know it and then I'll be right. And that will satisfy the needs of my faith. Um, nothing could be further from the truth. And in both instances, what we're missing there is the understanding that these runes are here to help us. If we know them rightly and read them true, they, we have them to help us. And it went and everything we just read is how they're here to help us. Everything we just read in the Ballad of the Victory Bringer, I mean, think about that. The Ballad of the Victory Bringer. She gives him the literal keys to the universe, how to incorporate ourselves into the world we're in, how to, how to be a part of the environment that we find ourselves in. The Ballad of the Victory Bringer is such that it teaches us the proper use of the rooms. And you can't read that enough. To read it again and again and again, and each time something new will appear. It teaches us how we might interact, and it tells us at the very end, he who knows them rightly and reads them true has them himself to help, ever they aid till the gods are gone. So when I wrote Life and the Love of Life, I put forth this, the idea that, okay, suppose there was a civilization before. I've kind of talked about how it was destroyed, what else might happen, how it might be destroyed again. How would an ancient set of gods, knowing full well what the world was going to have to go through with wars and famine and pestilence and death ever at the doorstep with plagues that kill a third of Europe, not once, but twice, 
with empires that roll through and destroy every bit of evidence, with volcanoes, tidal waves, earthquakes, comet strikes, all of these great barriers to the movement forward of men, how would the gods help people understand how to continue on and how to deal with the next catastrophe? Why the runes seem like a pretty good suggestion. A Morse code that has traveled through history. And it's such an effective idea that men did the same thing when they sent Cassini spacecraft out into space. On a golden record in ones and zeros, the digital code. We put all of the information about who and what we are on a golden record and shot it out into space. A message that will travel through who knows what kind of trials and obstacles to meet another culture. And they now have all the information they need to whoop our ass. But when we look at the idea that these runes have passed through time, all of these obstacles, a literal eradication of entire cultures, these runes have been carved in stone. And they may be carved in stone, we might know them, but if we shave them off into the ale we drink, we might have even greater understanding. These runes are here ever to aid us till the gods are gone, not to help us win a victory if we've been some kind of turd in life, not to help us. It's kind of like the guy that goes to court because he's committed a crime and he's, in, he's going to go to jail, so he makes an offering to tear. I mean, it just couldn't be more wrong in every, about every aspect of it. But I digress. No, I don't. That's valid, powerful information people need to understand. Brunhild spake, now shalt thou choose for the choice is given. Thou tree of the biting blade, that is the man that can wield the sword. Speech or silence is thine to say, our evil is destined to all. So these choices they're making right now are going to have effects on everybody around them. It is that web of weird. Sigurd spake, I shall not flee, though fate be near. I was not born a coward to be. He stands his ground. Thy loving word for mine will I win as long as I, as long as I shall live. So he makes a commitment there. He makes a, a, a lifelong commitment right then and right there. She has given him a glimpse of what it means to be united with the divine feminine. She has given him a glimpse of what it might really mean to have a successful union with someone that is a full, powerful, completing, complementing aspect of, of who he is. They are the yin and yang, so to speak. But he also knows there's going to be challenges there. There's going to have to be some things that change. There's going to have to be some understanding that happens. There's going to have to be some growth involved in all of it. Too many men will shy away from that. In fact, the majority of men shy away from that. And if you doubt it, look at how the Muslim world treats women. They're stoned to death. They're literally blacked out. And much of Christianity, the woman must know her place. She must walk behind, wear long hair and dresses, and all that nonsense. This is a refutation of that ideal in its entirety. In its entirety, it's a refutation of, of that place of women. Then first I read thee that free of guilt toward kinsmen ever thou art. No vengeance have, though they work thee harm. Reward after death shalt, thou shalt win. So right there he says, we're not going to waste our time arguing with all these people. We're not going to carry the guilt of all these other people. People might run their mouths and talk, but we're not going to we're not going to waste our time, our energy, our resources dealing with with lesser men who have ideas and try to shame guilt. This is what Reagan did to Sigurd his entire life. Feed him this victim story where he might help him. You know, I love you, uh, but I've been wronged. You need to take care of it. This is a refutation. He will not fall prey to that kind of manipulation again. And second, I read thee to swear no oath, if thou know, if, if true thou knowest it not. Bitter the fate of the breaker of troth, and poor is the wolf of his word. So don't waste your time swearing oaths on things that are not fully manifested. If you're sitting here swearing an oath to a group of backyard individuals, it's still a binding oath. And there's still going to be repercussions to, uh, to deal with if you swear an oath to someone who isn't everything they say they are. This goes back to Reagan, this manipulation of a lesser man, of a better, more developing man, that oath is still there. 
and it's gonna you're gonna have hell to pay trying to get that lesser man agree to releasing him from that oath. He's got power over it. Why would he do that? Don't swear an oath if you know it not to be true. And every time we go to do these things, we're going to know it in our heart long before words come out of our mouth. Peter the faith, the breaker of troth. See that? Pick your people wisely. Don't waste your time with them. You've got to learn to identify who's worth it and who isn't. And in my time, you can pretty much be assured that those individuals that are talking about how much they must hate this group or that group, that's a waste of time. That's a shit show. If you're looking at individuals who spend all their time talking about what source material they need to, to uh, know before they can be considered real heathen, that's a regurgitation of the failure of Theodish ideologies, which I don't see anybody around anymore practicing that because they spent an inordinate amount of time feeling fully, fully believing that if they could most accurately reenact those ideas, they might be able to yield some, get some of the benefits of it and never develop their spirituality. But you've got to pick the people that are worth it. And you can always pick it by what they're talking about, what they're acting like. I can show, if you show me your friends, I can show you your future. It's a pretty simple calculation. If you're hanging out with people that are always interested in some kind of nonsense, that's what your life's going to be, a bunch of nonsense. Then third, I read that thou at the thing shalt not fight in words with fools, for the wiser man unwise a worse word than he thinks doth utter oft. So don't waste your time dealing with those individuals. So you, you, you deal with them, you, you can identify them by the words they speak, and you want to argue with them, it's not going to get you anywhere. It's a, and actually I've got pretty good at rope it open them because I can, you know, say the right thing and they'll flare up like a hemorrhoid and then you got them. Um, but they're still fools. They're still a waste of time. And that's one of my guilty pleasures, but whatever. Don't fight with people in words with these fools. Um, knock him out. You know, I mean, that really needs to be what happens. You need to just give him a slap and go on about your way. Ill it is, if silent thou art, a coward born men call thee, and truth mayhap may tell. Seldom safe is fain, unless wide renown be won. On the day thereafter, send him to death, and let him pay the price of his lies. Um, you can't just sit by and let people run over you. And like I said, don't sit there and argue with them. You're going to have to take care of business. And you're going to, have to do it in a, in a powerful manner. Um, seldom safe is fain unless wide renown be won. So if you're going to go out there and do it, this is that high performing individual. If you're going to go out there and do it, you need to understand what sacrifices you're going to have to make. You can't appease everybody. You can't please everybody. You can't, you can't ride that middle ground. You've got to pick a course. You've got to understand what's, what you need to sacrifice, sacrifice it, and become that high performing individual. You're not, you can't sit there and wait for it to come to you. You've got to go out and take it. And sometimes that might mean calling a spade a spade, which I see all too many people unwilling to do because, well, uh, you know, those people might not like me. Nobody cares. I mean, honestly, when you look at all of it and everything that's being said and all of these points that are being made, when you look outside of Ossetru, anyone that wants to look in at it and they see all these people arguing about source material or what can you quote or you know, how much I hate, or maybe, maybe the third right might have been, nobody gives a shit. No, I mean, you look at it, nobody cares. It's none of that is generating the kind of high performance individual that's going to go out in this world and garner for themselves some success or some fame. And for 40 years now, we've been content to do that. I'm looking at two stanzas right here from the ballad of the victory bringer that say, quit wasting your time on that, get out there, grab the world by the balls and make some fame for yourself. Build a fortune, show the world that everything we're doing here will generate the kind of individual that has unmitigated success, that's not determined or has a condition set upon it by some other lesser man who has never ventured out into the world to try and do any of it. I have two stanzas right there that say it. Get out there, get on your horse, and give it all you got. 
Then forth I read, if thou shalt find a wily witch on thy road, it is better to go than her guest be, that though night enfold thee fast. That is the, that's the, the witch is those be wild, the bewitching of men's minds. You know, all too often we get suckered in by the opposite sex with some kind of nonsense, words of flattery or whatever. And a lot of times these end up being just simple manipulations. That witch will never create and help him. He could never build an environment sufficient for that witch to be happy in. And no woman could ever build a home that a man might come home to and be satisfied with it. See, the witch is the stunted individual that's trying to use this shortcut over here or that shortcut over there. And when we spend our time trying to take the shortcut in life, instead of trying to do what it just said, build some fame, don't waste time on fools and build some fame for yourself. When you come across the wily witch, her goal is not going to be to help you move that idea forward. Same, same thing for women and men. Sometimes you'll come across a man that's all bluff and bravado trying to win some fame for himself, but he's not going to create that environment where you might be free to express the beauty of who you are. <coughs> so even if night is coming upon you, don't sacrifice who and what you are because you're scared of the dark. Eyes that see the needs of need the sons of men who fight in battle fierce, all for which is evil sit by the way, who blade and courage blunt. Few things can steal the courage of a man than the, it's like laughing at some guy's willy. And I have no other way to put it. If you, hey, close, hey, Derek, Jeff, What's close that door. If you're sitting there trying to build up who you are and develop some self esteem or courage or presence of who you are, if you come across an individual who falls back on the idea of making fun of some aspect of who you are, you're dealing with an individual that is not interested in moving you forward. It doesn't matter if you're overweight or you're not competent or you may not be the most attractive person in the world. If you've got kind of beautiful self-esteem that emanates from within you, that's what you cultivate. And when you come across individuals who are more interested in making fun of that, don't waste your time with them. They will steal the wind from your sails. They will blade and courage blunt. They will rob you of the drive. I don't know how many men I see come from homes where they spend all their time arguing with their wives and the best they can hope for is to be average because they're beat down. They don't have any, they don't have any hope. The, the person that they were waiting on to tell them they're man enough is spending all her time telling them how stupid he is and how he can't do this and blah, blah, blah. And it goes the same way for women. Every time a woman comes home and there's some man telling her, you're a this and you're a that, and why ain't dinner ready? These kind of relationships are the poisons that ruin our ability to secure a future for who and what we want to become. And it's time to start standing up for it. And I have another stanza right here that supports it. Then fifth, I read thee, thou maidens fair, thou seest on the benches sitting. Let the silver of kinship not rob thee of sleep, and the, ki and the kissing of women beware. Don't be fooling around. Have some integrity about yourself. Don't be fooling around with these, with these women that are flirting with their hair and doing all this. And, and the same thing for, for girls. Just because he looks like some kind of hot dude, his hair is perfectly quaffed and he smells of Axe body spray, don't waste your time on that joker. If he's sporting a six pack, you're wasting your time on him because he's spending all his time doing sit-ups so he can be pretty, so he can draw the attention of someone and it may not necessarily be you. Those guys that are sporting a six pack, most of the time, I, let me see what their bank account looks like, huh? Let me see what their, uh, let's see the, the quality of their emotions. Let's see their integrity. And I would say this, but I know Chase McDougall sports a six pack, but he's a bad dude, man. I'm just, I mean, there's no bones about it. That's so much tough. For five hours yesterday, I went to his martial arts seminar and I got the shit beat out of me. So I'm not going to make fun of him, but for the rest of them, I will. So let's pay attention to that. Um, don't waste your time worrying about how much money you lost. The silver of kinship, don't let it rob you of sleep. You know, there's, there's some really powerful things that are happening all around us. If you're an individual that believes in yourself and 
all of this, if it does nothing else, has got to be engendering with us, within us a solid belief in ourselves. For the first time in many of our lives, we're beginning to get a belief in ourselves, the quality of who we are, that we might stand up again in this world and hold our heads up high. A failed relationship will be the quickest thing to steal that from us. Then sixth, I read thee, if men shall wrangle and ale talk rise to wrath, no words with a drunken warrior have, for wine steals many men's wits. You know, every you can go to about just any bar in this world, and about midnight, those guys that don't have a girlfriend, that are not going to go home with someone they picked up, about midnight, they're usually drunk enough, that's when the fights start. Um, that's, that's kind of what they're talking about. Don't waste your time arguing with a drunk. And those people that spend all their time staying drunk or stoned or messed up on something, you're wasting your time. They're a fool. They're always going to look for the shortcut, for the easy way. They're not ever going to grow. Don't waste your time on it. And if they want to come along with the success you're trying to build, come along. But don't sit there and argue with them because you're, you're, you're wasting time. Brawls and ales full oft have been an ill to many a man. Death for some and sorrow for some and many of the woes of men. These people in these bars will kill you. You get into a fist fight with somebody, he may not necessarily want to fist fight you. And he may know full enough how to kill you with, he may shoot you, he may stab you. Don't waste your time with these jokers. There's nothing in there, in, those, in that lifestyle, that's going to help you become any kind of individual who might move forward in this world. In seventh, I read thee, if battle thou seekest with the foe that is full of might, it is better to fight than to burn alive in the hall of the hero rich. Don't back down. You might come across uh, the best business deal in the world, but you're intimidated because this guy's got more success than you. You might come across somebody that he might beat you up again and again, but don't back down. Have some courage. Stand your ground. Um, who knows? If you die, if you go out swinging, there's a lot of infantry soldiers if that's the way they'd want. I want to go out swinging. I want to go out with my boots on. I'm not going to back down. If you're spending all your time drinking, you're liable to find yourself in that situation a lot sooner than you would if you were using your mind the way you're supposed to. Then eighth, I read that evil thou shun and beware of lying words. Take not a maid nor the wife of a man, nor lure them on to lust. If you're, see, there's a special place in misty hell for the deceivers of men's wives and murderers and oath breakers. And they've all been talked about now. These are the people whose lives will never amount to anything because they're focused on all the wrong shit. Beware, the, shun evil. If you see people over there screwing around, stay away from them. They ain't got no common sense about them. They ain't got no discipline about them. And they don't have what it takes to help move themselves forward in this world. Stay away from them and don't be trying to steal some man's wife. There's a lot of things in this world that suck, but those guys that, that uh, feed on the chaos of an unstable home are worms and no, in, in, in no uncertain sense of the word. The ninth I read thee burial render if thou findest a fallen corpse of sickness dead or dead in the sea or dead of weapons wounds. A bath shalt thou give them who corpses be, and hands and head shalt wash. Wipe them and comb or they go in the coffin and pray that they sleep in peace. Once a person has fought his way through this world and the only thing he's left behind is a corpse. If they die of sickness, if they die in the sea and they die of a weapons wound, take care of them. Do the right thing because that person has fought his way through this world and you don't know and obviously he lost. He's come to a point where the only thing he's left behind is a corpse. Show some respect and have some honor. On this Memorial Day tomorrow, that's something we need to pay attention to. Those men that ventured forth and the only thing they asked for was a small plot of ground on which to bury their dead so other people might be free. We bathe them, we comb them and pray that they sleep in peace. Then tenth I read thee that thou never trust the word of the race of wolves, if his brother thou broughtest to death, or his father thou didst fell. Often a wolf and a son there is, though glad he gladly takes. If you're the man that has shot your father, 
I have a stanza right here that says you are never going to be the kind of individual worthy of having any kind of troth with. Doesn't matter if it buys you a house or anything else, there's gonna be something wrong in this thought process. Instead of trying to live up to or stand there and fight with or figure it out or grow or develop into something that can handle the shortcomings of the father and become a better man, to kill your own father is a, is, how do you fix that? How do you tell the world I did the right thing? When all of the world looks at that and sees that man couldn't figure out how to deal with his own family. And we're supposed to believe in that? We're supposed to believe that he can be something better? No. <clears throat> Battle and hate and harm, methinks, full seldom fall asleep. Wits and weapons the warrior needs, if boldest of men would be. It's always out there. There's an entire world out there that doesn't believe the way we believe. There's an entire world out there that would just as soon see us fail, shoot ourselves in the foot, not make it, uh, prove how much of a flake we are because we're going against the grain. Make no mistake, they will line up uh, by the dozens to point out how much of a failure we are because one turd out of a thousand is sitting over here talking about how well, Hitler, what if he was right? Blah, blah, blah. That characterizes everybody. Doesn't matter what you want to try to do to, to distance yourself from it. You got one guy over here, battle and hate and harm, full seldom fall asleep. And that's it right there. They never go to sleep. There's always something going on in this world. Life is cheap outside of these United States, I assure you. And all over the place, people are killing each other. And if you go to Chicago, you can bet your butt. There's somebody shooting somebody right now. Detroit, all of these inner city, these people are living in a manner that is more reminiscent of those ancient tribal ways where vengeance belonged in their hands than it did in somebody else's. So you need to be aware as you travel this world, not everybody's going to be thinking the same way you do. Some people are going to be thinking, what can I take out of this person? What can I steal from this person while I laugh at him? How much can I get out of this person so I can continue to be a turd in this world? They're there. And if you waste your time arguing with a fool, you'll find out who they are. If you waste your time trying to kiss the pretty maidens because you're trying to prove how much a man you are, you'll find them. Guarantee it. Then 11th, I read thee, that wrath thou shun, and treachery false with friends. Not long the leader's life shall be, for greater the foes he faces. So if you're acting in a deceitful way, if you're saying, come here with one hand, and then going somewhere else and talking about him bad, that kind of treachery, don't waste time on him. Don't sit there and stew about how mad you're going to be because they're saying this or that or the other about you. Let them run their full mouths. Let them run their full mouths because they're not going to do anything to prove what an ass they are. If we spend all of our time, if you find yourself in a leadership position of some kind and we take any more time than necessary to rid ourselves of poisonous aspects that might do harm to the community, and spend our time going through all of these things where all these people are saying all this stuff about us. We're wasting our time and we're focusing on the wrong things. If you're focusing on all the treachery of all these people, you're wasting your time. You're not building a mindset congruent with building a future for yourself. So we're at, um, and that's, that's the last of the v Ballad of the Victory Bringer. Next week, I'm not sure which one I want to do next week, but um, we'll do something fantastic, I'm sure. I may, I uh, oh, will see, we'll figure it out. <laughs> but I do appreciate everyone's time on this.